Welcome to the after lunch session and our industrial energy efficiency session. Uh, I trust once again we'll have some interesting speakers for you to share the journey that some of us have taken on the uh, on the IE project and the the energy um, focus that the centres currently have. Um, in terms of our our first speaker, I'm going to invite um, Wendy de Cruz up. Wendy will be um, sharing a little bit of her experiences and knowledge around the ENMS or energy management system implementation. Uh, Wendy is, is one of our um, very seasoned um, consultants, which we've been using from Wendy de Cruz and Associates. And uh, she's, I think, one of our original ENMS specialists that, that actually qualified um, through our um, training programs and expert level um, skills development program that we've had running um, within NCPC. So without further ado, I'd like to invite you and uh, let it blow us away with what she's done. Thanks. Thank you, Kevin. No pressure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Kevin has said, my name is Wendy, and I've been involved with the IE program since its inception in, in South Africa and in a couple of other countries as well. I've been asked today um, to share some of, the, some of the highlights related to implementation. But before I begin, I just want to say to everybody, to those of you that are here and to the whole of the NCPC, it's always inspiring to come to these sessions, to hear what has happened, what is happening, and what is going to happen, and what the possibilities are into the future. Um, I tend to have a, a view that we, we get a lot of doom and gloom, and so it's really, really good. And I thank all the speakers and all the organizers um, for, for bringing to our attention the good and the positive stuff that is actually happening. As you all know, this is the reason the NCPC exists, and the area that I'm going to be touching on is the energy component within RECP. The, the role that I've played um, in, in terms of the services provided um, has been a lot around training, facilitation, um, at the various levels of ENMS training. Um, and I must say that every time I facilitate I learn as much as I teach, and so it's been a really, a really great effort. Um, I've also worked on consulting projects, which entail going into companies and working with the people in the company to help them implement an energy management system that's based on the ISO 50001 standard. And I've also been involved in readiness audits for those organizations that seek ISO 50001 certification. So what I've done for this, because I was asked really to share, I'm, I'm not teaching today, and if anybody else has awesome things to share, please, please pop up. Um, I've tried to think about the various projects that I've worked on over the last 10 or 11 years, um, and just share with you some of the interesting things that came out of the work that I did and the, the case studies that I was involved in. And it's, it's looking at implementation um, Im impacts. Okay. The first one I'd like to start with um, is actually a global success story, and that is Johnson Mathey. Um, it was the first project that the South African um, IE project worked on, which meant it was also the first global project because UNIDO started their IE program in South Africa, and they started, this was, this was the project that I was, was working on. Um, as you know, it's a corporate, they make the catalytic converters for the automotive industry, and they have representation all around the world. Um, and all around the world, the energy engineers and the energy operators within Johnson Bathy look to South Africa because they've done such a good job. Um, before I drill into the sorts of things that they do, I'd just like to share with you what they themselves said were the challenges and the lessons learned. 
Firstly, behavioral. We heard from one Atari, and in fact, every speaker that you ever hear of who speaks about energy and energy efficiency talks about the behavioral side of things. So they found that behavioral changes were critical um, in, their, in their program. The second issue they, ha they focused on was measurement and metering. Those of you that have been involved in the NCPC IE project from the beginning will remember that we used to, in the beginning of this program, not put a lot of, a lot of emphasis on measuring and metering. We used to say you can improve energy performance even if you're not metering every little thing in your plant. That remains true, but there is no doubt that if you install metering that tells you, and, and we heard wonderful stories from Vincent from Tiger Brand, that they are tracking every day, they're probably tracking hourly, knowing where their energy is, is going and whether it's enough or too much or whether they're, they're saving so they can react quicker. This was exactly the thing that was picked up by Johnson Matthey. The third thing, and this has been a common theme in, my, in, in all of my ISO 50001 ENMS IE consulting projects, and that is the core role that the energy team plays. Um, ISO 50001 was one of the first standards that mandated the need for an energy team, or I think Vince called it a, an energy committee, or an RECP committee. Um, and the people that are selected to be on that team really need to be carefully thought out. It, it mustn't be too big, because otherwise, like any team or committee, not much gets done. But it needs to cover sufficient scope within an organization, firstly, so that the energy management system can be implemented wherever it needs to be. So one needs to have people from production as well as engineering, utilities, even project management and production planning if it's a production company. And this was something Johnson Matthew pointed out. Thirdly, they found that knowledge and awareness needs to be spread as wide as possible throughout the organization. Not to make everybody in the company experts, but so that there can be knowledge around energy. What does it mean to waste energy? What are the ways that one cannot waste them? And why is it important to think about energy? Because this was coming in, in, in 2011, 2012, um, we'd had the blackouts, but South Africa was still relatively new uh, with regards to, to concrete systematic um, energy saving in, in certain sectors. And then last but not least, and this particular slide has been shown around the world um, regarding what, what, NC, what Johnson Matthey did. They identified that attitude is king. And this quote in this green block that you see comes directly from a presentation that the, um, Gavin, Gavin Puckle presented at a, at a conference. Um, it was replicated, I've seen it replicated in Vienna at the UNIDA offices more than once. What he said is attitude is king. He said awareness and knowledge is key. Because if you don't know about potential saving opportunities, you won't look for them. So that's where this awareness and knowledge kicks in. If you don't look for savings, obviously you won't find them. So you, you're on the back foot already. And then he finished off by saying, if you don't care, the savings will not happen. In other words, in the circle, it's all around attitude. So the, the technology may be perfect, the energy management systems may be perfect, but if the attitude from the people involved um, is not on board, if they can't see value in what's happening, um, then, it's, then it's a problem. I've titled this slide, um, Johnson Matthey Attitude and Surprise Savings, because, um, and I think these slides are being made available so you can look at them in more, in more detail, but this is the summary from the from the case study that was done on the first phase of, of Johnson Matthey. And you'll see that the total savings were 9.4 million kilowatt hours. Not a bad saving. However, what is really interesting is that the projects that we tracked, they realized five, about 5.5 million kilowatt hours of savings. The balance, nearly 3.9 million kilowatt hours of saving, we could actually not directly track where those savings came from. 
Um, we believe that this revolves around this whole attitude is king and the behavioral issue. Um, we do suspect that some of the savings opportunities came from people fixing their problems without saying anything. Um, particularly one that we did know about is um, the, the utility compressors. We're pretty sure they were running 24-7. And after the awareness was created to switch things off when they're not needed, uh, the utility compressors, we suspect, stopped being run on, on Saturdays and Sundays, which gives you two-sevenths of your, of your energy saving. But um, a lot of people have warned me when I started in this business. They said, you'll, you'll, you'll calculate savings, you'll estimate what your savings are, but when you actually implement them, brace yourself because you're gonna get less than you expect. In 11 years, I'm mostly getting more than I expect. And so I think the attitude and the behavior is, is, where, it, is where it kicks in. And now I'm just going to be doing a small check if you're awake, please raise your hand. <laughs> ah. Every, every sector requires KPIs. Um, and for me, my primary KPI is that at least half the people are awake five minutes into my presentation. So thank you guys, you're, you're with me. The second um, company that I thought I would share with you is, is Zamalco. And these guys implemented furnace improvements. They followed the very standard approach to um, using NCP um, methodology to implement an energy management system. Um, so they did capacity building with the NCPC. They sent the, the people that they considered key on the NMS expert program. Then they did an energy review so that they could understand what, where their energy was going, what it was doing. Um, they then did um, the, the implementation of projects that they had identified, and they tried to make the identification of projects as global, as, as company-wide as possibly could be. So they used things like um, green areas and toolbox talks to, to motivate um, even, even the operators to come up with ideas of how they thought that energy could be, could be saved. Um, they then, as phase four, integrated their energy management system into the other ISO systems. They had 9001, which is quality management, 14,000, which is environmental, and 45,001, which is health and safety. But they had not slotted energy in right from the beginning. They were a little cautious. They said, we don't know this energy animal. Let us rather get it up and running, see how well it's doing, and then we'll, we'll integrate. So page, phase four was integration, and five was the, the maintenance, um, keeping, things, keeping things going. But what for me was interesting on this is their project was, um, was gas related. A lot of people that I work with think that energy management is about electricity, which it is, but it doesn't, it's not only electricity. And they had three key projects. I just want to share them with you because sometimes you have to spend money, but sometimes you really don't. The first related to the furnace loading. Um, the pro what Zamalco does is they recycle um, uh, aluminium, well, the various products from waste. So they have furnaces that smelt this waste. And in talking to the teams and discussing how energy could be saved, the guys came to realize that when you load a furnace, you have to open the furnace. So you heat it up in this particular case, you bring it up to temperature, then you open the furnace and you load in what needs to be furnished. In this particular case, you're loading in waste. And what they came up with was the idea to, far, to speed up the loading. They were um, partially compacting the waste that came in so that it could be loaded easier, but they spent effort on compacting it more. And they came up with a design. I, I kid you not, it looks like a very big checkers shopping trolley. It's, a, it's large and it's kind of pointed to the front. And what they did, while the what they do now, while the furnace door is closed, they load, sorry guys, they do have a more professional name for this, but I'm gonna call it a checkers trolley. I think we can relate to that. They then load the checkers trolley, get the fork, get it in position in front of the furnace, get the forklifts behind it, open the furnace door and just push forward this compacted waste that needs to go into the furnace and close the door. So they reduced the time that the, the door is open 
from about 20 minutes or so, which what it used to take to get the, the contents into the furnace, to less than two minutes, because it was just a case of opening and squeezing it. And those of you, we all know, the more you open a heated area, the more gas you're going to use to, to keep heating it. This didn't cost anything, um, and a non-energy benefit that they experienced is that the team was motivated, because the guys who came up with this concept, I think it was a little triggered by management, but it was, it was put in the hands of the, of the operator team and the, and the shift leaders, and when they were able to achieve this and they could actually see the benefits that had been realized, um, it, it really was reported to me as being, as being motivational. The second project they had did relate to, to furnace design. They changed, the, the, previously the burners was one a central burner, they changed it to burners from the side. For that project they did have to spend about, um, about 300,000, so there are times when any energy efficiency pro project or team does need to, to spend money. Um, and then the third, the dross heat recovery. Um, what happens when you furnace waste, metal waste, to recover it, is you de develop a layer of gunk. Uh, it's called dross on top of that. And that needs to be scooped off. It's very hot. Obviously, if you're furnacing at eight or 900 degrees, this is extremely hot. And they came up with the idea of taking the dross, which goes into slightly smaller mini crucibles, taking it out of the furnace, and putting it on top of the compacted waste that was about to be loaded. This did two things. Firstly, it preheated the compacted waste that now had to go into the, into the furnace. So there was free energy in preheating. It reduced the time for smelting, so they got one extra batch per day by putting in preheated, and there was no technology involved at all. They take the crucible, the, the, the forklift drivers are there, really amazing, and put it on top of the, the waste that's about to go in. The second benefit that they got from that is that the dross cooled quicker, because obviously the heat from the dross, I, I see Reynolds nodding his head, he was also involved in this, um, the heat that was going from the dross to, to heat up, to preheat, meant that the cooling happened quicker. And that meant that that dross could hit the waste stream much quicker. Before that, it took about two days for that dross to cool down sufficiently to be handled. And once the heat was being recovered by preheating, it happened a whole lot quicker. Guys, I don't know if you think this is, this is worthwhile sharing, um, and I, I know most of you are not melting dross in your spare time, um, but it's just to bring to the, to the fore that it doesn't have to be seriously technical solutions. Sometimes there's a hang of a lot of saving that can be achieved just through thinking about these things. And on this particular project, um, they spent about 335,000 rand on, on all the different initiatives. And th this was initially, and then in the first six months, um, they saved about 500,000. And this was back in the day when um, kilowatt hours were less than a rand. So it was really a, a good, good project. What they found in this company were, were critical success issues. Firstly, it was credibility of energy management. What this company had experienced is consultants coming into the company and telling them that they could save a whole whack of money if they bought something from them. And they didn't, they didn't have good success with those, and so they didn't trust energy management. They didn't trust industrial energy efficiency to actually give them a real saving. They thought it was just job creation and it was going to interfere with their, with their production. Now, that, at that time, that was a very real thing. And those of you who have been involved in um, ENMS projects have probably come across this to a greater or lesser extent. The lesson that I learned from that is you cannot ignore people's perceptions. If people perceive that energy management is just a, a, a lot of nonsense, that is their reality, that's what they perceive. Then you have to almost take a step back and take a bit of time to convince them that actually there are ways of, of saving energy that do not include spending a lot of money and do not include compromising their business. In this particular case, as I've said, the, 
they, they got an extra batch because they could add preheated, so they, they gained from their energy saving opportunities. Okay. So that was really what, um, what Zamalko shared with, with me, um, what we went through at that, at that time. Um, Ambilo wastewater treatment plant. Um, in my first life, I'm a biochemist. Um, so this was a, a project where everybody thought, ha, Wendy's going to win this one because she should know what's going on. Um, well, I do hope that I know something that's going on. But the truth is that I did not, we did not come up with a biochemical solution to this wastewater treatment plant. What happened um, on the plant, it's a small plant, it's, it's not, it doesn't have um, online testing, which is what the mo more modern plants, they test the online, they, they um, oxygen, uh, dissolved oxygen levels, and then the aerators, which are motors, in this particular case, 75 kilowatt motors, they operate for more or less time, depending on what the level of dissolved oxygen is, because their job is to aerate, to get oxygen into the water. This little treatment works did not have that. So they had four aerators, and the setup on the aerators, so maybe two aerators ran for six hours a day, then another one was added for another six hours, and all four ran in the mornings and in the afternoons when you and I are doing our, doing our thing that ends up at a wastewater, a wastewater treatment plant. And what we did, when we looked at this, it's a fairly small plant, we said, my first question, because I really didn't know, I said, why do these aerators, sometimes you run four, sometimes you run three, sometimes you run two, and, and they explained it to me and it made complete sense. And I said, okay, well, how do you know how long to run four as opposed to running two as opposed to running three? And there was a little bit of a silence, but they're very clever people. Um, process engineers are very clever people. Uh, they, they actually thought about it a bit more, and they said, you know, Wendy, we, we actually don't know. So I said, well, can we find out? And amazingly, they still had all of the, um, the documentation for this plant as it had been designed, and that plant was older than I am, which is really, really old. And they discovered that they were running the aerators more than 10% more than was needed by the design of that plant. So if there should have been perhaps, I don't know, 56 hours of running time from those four aerators, they were running at 60, 66 or something. I forget the, the exact numbers. Guys, these case studies I'm sharing with you are available from the, from the NCPC. It's not confidential if you want to get a bit more detail. But what they did is they then started asking around, and, and I'm sure a number of you are going to relate to this. What happened on that plant is when they had aeration problems, the first thing they did, what do you think? You're running a, a plant that requires aeration and you're having problems with aeration, what are you going to do with your four aerators? They didn't shut it down, they ran it more because they said, okay, we are running our aerators for, let's say, 50 hours collectively. We're having aeration problems. Let's bump it up a little bit. And so they would do that without fully analyzing what the impact was, because energy was cheap. None of us used to analyze these things. So when we did this um, assessment and we said, you know, guys, you shouldn't be right. Theoretically, this plant should not need these aerators to run so many hours in every 24 hours. Can we cut back? Well, the first thing we needed to do was acknowledge the risk, because if you start running your aerators slower, you may end up with a problem that your sewage is not being treated the way that it should. And so we agreed it would be a step-by-step um, -step process. But basically, the by returning back to the design specifications with a little bit of a buffer, because it was an old plant, that whole plant energy was saved by 10%. Um, and I've, I've sort of said it, it, it cost 600 rand. Um, that was the cost of getting the, uh, getting the head office guys to come out and teach the local guys how to, how to reset the timing. The message for me on this is, is back to basics, but also understand your processes really well. 
you need to know exactly what your energy is doing. Um, Wanatari made reference to um, end user requirements. In other words, if she, she used the example of, of compressed air. If you pumping out compressed air at 10 bar, but you only need seven bar for the, for the application for what the compressed air energy is doing, you are wasting a hang of a lot of, a lot of money. And so that's what you need to do. If you're involved in this project or if it's your company, understand very clearly exactly what it is that the, the energy is doing, um, and then you can look to see if there are opportunities to, to, fine, to fine tune. Those of you that have been involved in, in, to any degree in the um, NCPC energy program or the, or the UNIDO program will know that it is critical to have a baseline. Um, a baseline is a reference point against which you can compare to know whether you have saved energy. And the reason we need such a baseline is because even with Kevin's huge budget, he has been unable to purchase a meter that measures how much energy was saved. Those of you who've ever been on a diet will know the same thing. Do any of you have a scale that measures how many kilograms you lost? We don't have it. We have a scale that tells us how much we weigh, and we go away and, and diet and exercise fanatically. Then we come back a week later and we step on that same scale it doesn't tell us how many kilograms we've lost. It tells us how many kilograms we weigh. And then what do we do? How do we know how many kilograms we lost? We subtract. We look at the difference between the two. And that's a pretty easy thing to do for most people. But if you were a pregnant woman, what would happen? I'm only looking at Tanya because she's the most recent mother that I know. <laughs> It doesn't work the same, does it? Because now, on the one hand, you are frantically exercising and you're dieting, obviously not putting your baby at risk. On the other hand, your baby's growing. So you expect to go up somewhat. So now, if you step on the scale, wait a week doing all the healthy things that you plan to do, and you come back a week later, that mother may not weigh less. She may, 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 war, may weigh more but she would expect to weigh more because her baby's growing. And so what does she now need to do? She needs to evaluate whether the additional kilograms that she's weighing are more or less than she expected to put on because she's pregnant. It's not an easy thing. There's no absolute numbers. I mean, I think mothers can put on anything between 10 and 20 kilograms, so it's not an exact number. And that's the challenge we have with energy management. We have to compare the actual energy that we consumed, which we can measure very easily, we have meters to do that, like you have bathroom scales for your weight, we have to compare it to something. And that something is called a baseline. It's the amount of energy that we expected to consume under whatever conditions we were working. So the next project, um, this was one that, um, that we, we did specifically around baselining, because the better your baseline is, the better your reference point, and it's, it's, it's a baseline, it's a model, I'm not gonna go into the stats now, but it's a, it's, it's a model into which you can plug data that you can measure. So in this particular instance, um, the first model, um, this is a plastics manufacturing company, so the first model, they said to me, that the amount of kilograms that they produce on a monthly basis, the amount of, it's called conversion in the plastics industry, um, influences the amount of energy that they consume. And so we do a statistical modeling on that, and we came up with, with this here. So Y, which is the expected consumption, if you haven't done anything to, sa to waste energy and you haven't done anything to save energy, it's going to, in this particular case, equal 913 times the number of tons. So if you produce one ton, it's 913 kilowatt hours. If you produce 1,000 tons, it's 913,000 kilowatt hours, plus a base load, because that's the, that's the fixed, the, the non-variable, those of you that work in the financial, it's, it's the equivalent to fixed costs. That what you have to pay every month, irrespective of whether you're selling a lot of product or services or, or not. 
And this company, it, it was no, absolutely not the only one where this happened. They were battling to get a, um, a, a representative baseline. And so we said, well, let's do a case study and see. So the first case, the first model that we did included only tons converted. And in this case, the, the R squared or the correlation coefficient, in other words, the the match between how many tons I produce and how much energy I should consume was about 60, between 63 or 67%, depending on which um, correlation coefficient you're using. Then I spoke to the guys, I said, what is your energy doing? And we realized that their energy was not only converting the plastic uh, in terms of, of injection molding or pressuring, it was also heating and cooling. So we said, okay, then the, the temperature outside is going to impact on it. And we did the next baseline on tons converted and the mean monthly temperature. That's the average temperature for a month. And in that particular case, the R squared adjusted, which we use because there's more than one um, variable, improved up to 75.6%. What that told us is that 75.6% of the variation in our energy, our expected energy consumption, was due to a mixture of the tons converted and the cooling degree days. That's just a cooling demand measure. So in the months where there was a lot of cooling demand, like in summer, then they expected to consume more energy than they did in the, in the winter when they didn't need to cool so much because everything was really, was really chilled outside. And the third model that we tested, um, number three, was the tons converted, also against temperature, but in this particular uh, case, the cooling degree days. And you can see that the correlation got much better. It went right up to 80%. Again, this is just lessons that we learned. And a lot of you are probably saying, for goodness sake, Wendy, you've been telling us for this for 20 years, uh, for 10 years, so please, we all know this. Um, but there are frequent times when people don't understand or don't realize the significance of this. If you're using a model with a correlation of 0.8, you have a lot more confidence, and the NCPC and the government reporting has a lot more confidence in the, in the um, comparison than if you're looking at something that's maybe sitting at, at 0.6. And I use this particular case study to share with you because from the, um, f from the theoretical point of view, we normally say if you're sitting at, at, at 0.75, if you're sitting at 75%, that's, that's acceptable, that's pretty good. You can work with a model like that, and you can. But what these numbers show us here is just by slightly tweaking the way in which you measure your, your cooling demand or your temperature, we, we managed to push this up by, by 4%, um, up to, up to 0.8 or 80% on the, on the um, correlation coefficient. So which of these three models do you think we used? Obviously, we use number three. Thanks. Now I do know there's still some people awake. <laughs> um, another thing that um, part of my job with UNIDO um, was actually to spend quite a lot of time in, in Ukraine. I was in Kiev and, um, and Lviv. And most of the time we were working, um, but sometimes we did other things. And um, on one occasion, we had a heavy training session from Monday to Friday. Uh, Monday to Thursday, and on Friday morning, there was an exam in the morning, and in the afternoon, um, some of the guys that I was training said, Wendy, come and visit our brewery. Um, you're a biochemist, and let's see if you can tell us why we can't get a good baseline. Just like Kevin's introduction, no pressure. So we, we trekked off to the, to the brewery, and it was a Friday afternoon, um, and it was, it was interesting. It looks like the SAB breweries that I've, I've seen in South Africa. Um, and then I, I noticed it was very quiet. And I, I said to the guys around me, I said, sure, it's, this is a really quiet site. They said, oh, oh, no, 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 it's not normally like this. This is what we do on Fridays. We have our cleaning exercise. So every Friday... We, we change our normal practices and we do a very, very big cleaning exercise. 
And the penny just dropped because, and you'll know this, there, aren't, there is not a constant number of Fridays in a month. Some months have four Fridays and some months have five Fridays. And what they were doing with their correlation model when they were building their baseline, they were comparing each month with the, with the other month, even though their, their practices, their activities were not the same every month because of this Friday issue. Now, the reason we develop a baseline is so that we can have a pattern of consumption that helps us to predict what we should have consumed. But in their model, because they were not modeling against the number of Fridays in a month, their model assumed that every month was the same with regards to Fridays. So they just added a relevant variable of the number of Fridays in the month, and they got a much better, much better correlation. Obviously, they think I'm a super, a super energy person, but nothing to do with biochemistry again. So not, not too great on, on that front. Um, Mustic Limited, which is a company that you, you may be familiar with, um, their energy project, they obviously like you have to analyze the, the, the consumption areas and their HVAC, their heating, ventilation and air conditioning was the, was the largest consumer. Um, although they manufacture computers, most of the work is, is hand assembly, so they don't have a lot of energy going into the number of computers that they produce because they're made by hand, but they have a lot of energy going into conditioning the space that they, that they work in. And during the, the project there, um, sorry, I just want to get these through. We did a walkabout, um, and it's amazing how if you have a consultant or somebody from NCPC walking around with your, with your team, suddenly the team sees things that they didn't see before. I suppose it's a little bit like getting visitors. When you have visitors in your house, you suddenly notice that dust above the above the pelmet that you never saw for the last however, however long. I see Martin smiling there. Okay. So we did this and we walked through the store and it was delightful. The air was fresh and cool and conditioned and it was a really hot day and, and as we walked into it, it, all of us kind of thought, oh, okay, this is nice and cool, but it was only a store. And immediately, the, the energy um, manager on that site, he immediately said, Wendy, don't say anything, I know what you're going to say. And of course, what had happened is that area was being air conditioned unnecessarily. It's about change. What had happened on the plant on, in this um, area is the production area, which had been um, ventilated and conditioned before, had been reduced and the storage space had been expanded. But what they had not done is they hadn't sealed off the ducts into that area. So now we had like a really expensively air-conditioned storage area. Simple things, guys, but it's, um, yeah, doesn't take a huge budget to, to make the savings. Um, at this particular company, um, their total investment was, was less than 200,000, was just, in fact, less than 170,000 rand. Um, and they realized a 15% saving in the first year. Um, it's not a big, it's not a huge consumer, so it was 200 and about 233,000 kilowatt hours. But it happened because people looked for those opportunities and took notice of what's happening. And you might say, well, goodness me, that is really slack. They should have picked that up before. And the answer is yes, they probably should have. In this particular case, there was a change in utilities managers. So the guy who was involved in the, in the project to change the production area and the storage area location had left, he left and the new guy came in and he took over and in those days we didn't worry so much about, so much about energy. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? Okay. Um, guys, in, your, um, in, the, in the, the slides that you, you have access to, um, I've also just put in um, the product type, how it can make a difference. Um, this, these green lines are the expected consumption, zero, if you're looking at uh, Q sum, your actual versus expected. 
And this uh, particular company, if you looked at what they expected to consume to what they were actually consuming using the model, if the model was adjusted to take into account a product change that they introduced, this is how much energy they saved. They were way below what they expected. You know, it's when they stood on the scale a week later, it was lower. But if you did that, use those same numbers and you did not take into account that they changed their product mix, this is what the pattern looked like. And in this particular side, this is the amount of, of apparent overconsumption. Now, what happened here, this was the Tugela plant, they introduced um, a new product called Ultra, Ultra Flute. It's the strongest paper in the world, interestingly enough. It's very expensive because people who want strong paper will pay for it. So it's very profitable financially, but it consumes more energy to manufacture. And because it became more and more popular, the, the ratio of total paper that was Ultra Flute increased. And so their energy consumption went up. And if we had continued to use the old baseline model, it would have looked as if we were over-consuming or they were over-consuming. But what we needed to do is to adjust the model so that the model took into account not only how much paper was produced overall, but how much ultra-flute was, was produced. Um, I think that's... Um, and then this last one, and I hope Wanatari is okay with me sharing this. This hasn't. This is a case study that hasn't, um, you know, hasn't been reviewed. But it's to it's to share the importance of adjusting your expected consumption based on what's happening in the plant. This was the Mintec campus, and their energy saving project um, in in three phases was to upgrade their furnaces. Um, they did fuel switches, so they switched from electrical, from electricity to natural gas um, operated furnaces. So if you just looked at their electricity consumption, you would jump up and down and say, party time, because the amount of electricity was reduced. But it was reduced because it was changed to, to natural gas. So from a consumption point of view, there was actually no improvement because they were still consuming the same amount of energy. It just didn't come from Eskom. It now came from, from Sassel. And it's, it's not to say that it was not a good increase, uh, improvement. It was, even if one just looked at the environmental and, and cost issues. But it's really important when you are measuring how well you're doing with regards to energy, you have to take all the factors into account. Um, and in this particular case, and I've just included the calculations there, um, the overall savings from comparing the, the baseline to the actual consumption was about 3 million kilowatt hours, um, of which about 600,000 was from the fuel switch. And so the overall saving on electrical energy that was due to reducing energy and not switching it um, was, was modified down to, down to about 2.6 million. And I hope that the message that's coming out of this is that energy management is not a one, a one size fits all. Um, it, but having said that, it is in my view really, really valuable to, to look at case studies, to, to look at what other people are doing um, so that they can, um, you can learn from what, from what they've done. And just a personal wrap up for myself, um, is that, and this is the, the Zambezi River, which has lots of deep holes, which we all fall into from time to time, but it has a really solid old bridge that keeps you going where you need to, to go. And the energy management system, ISO 50001, is intended to be that. It provides the bridge to support continual improvement and to sustain the improvements that are achieved through, through energy management. And I was very, very chuffed to hear Vincent say earlier that um, his ENMS is now fully implemented. So all those wonderful savings that he shared um, are much more likely to be sustained into the future. Thank you very much.